finally, in the central axis of many paintings, we find moments of touch, especially of self-touch. The fact that an angel is rubbing his legs together in the middle of rest uh, on the flight into Egypt is anything but atypical. The self-touching, autoerotic moment of this angel. Very. This is anything but atypical. This is typical that in the center you have got these moments of self-touching. Uh, sorry. Similar motifs can be found in the Madonna of the Rosary, the great uh, Vienna painting. Uh, the central axis of this large altar painting is, one might say, clasped between two instances of self-touch. Uh, below the pilgrim's feet, there is a moment of slight self-touching here. Uh, one on top of the other, and above the gesture of the Christ child there. Uh, who touches more than shows his body. This belly, self-touching. Hoc um, est corpus meum. This is, of course, altar painting. This is the Eucharist, hoc est corpus meum. Um, or maybe hoc meum corpus est. Uh, incidentally, it is also typical that this child is not standing on his mother's legs, but between them. Typical Caravaggio motive. Strange thing. He's not. Look where he's standing. He's standing. He's standing in between. And of course, there's the second moment of uh, self-touch, indicating otium, as Rudolf Primersberger explained to me. And because of course, there's the antique statues. If they do this, indicating otium that they. Uh, okay, but the important thing is here in this formalist reading. There's the self-touch. Uh, in the central axis. Um, Caravaggio's moments of self-touch are curiously lost to the self. In them it becomes clear that any touch, and thus also any self-touch, assumes a separation. Any touch assumes a separation. Of course, in order to be able to touch itself, a body must be unified. I can only touch myself because I'm a unified but in some way, but it also must be divided into limbs, have parts that are distinct from each other, in a certain way be apart from itself. Since only when something lies apart can it draw close and touch. That's very clear. Only if something is apart can it draw close and touch. No self-touch without some type of fold. Basic principle. No self-touch with some, uh, some kind of fault. Plato's sphere people were not able to touch themselves. Imagine the sphere people of Plato rolling around in the space. They can't touch themselves. They can't touch other, sphere, other spheres, but they can't touch it themselves because they don't have got a fault. So it's a problem for us human beings that we are split beings, as Plato told us, but this is the advantage that we can touch ourselves and have the pleasures of erotic self and other kinds of touch, of course, but also we can touch ourselves, not to sphere people of Plato. So some advantages of being human. There's one more important thing. While Caravaggio was fascinated by bilateral symmetries, it seems that this was less about the equality of the sides than about the opposition to of left and right that such symmetries embody. He often used this most visually striking form of opposition which animates many of his paintings for the representation of invisible duplicities. The example of the op opposition of doubt and certainty as it is elaborated in Doubting Thomas is perhaps best suited to demonstrating what, what about duplicities uh, was interesting to Caravaggio in the first place, not the positive terms, if there's such a thing, but that which, lie, which lies between them. The formal interest in hinges and folds 
evidently corresponds to a similar, similarly strongly articulated interest on the level of content in between states and crunch points, or in logical terms, in the neither nor and the both and, which is the paradoxical side, the neither nor and the both and, and the both and. What happens between doubt and certainty or between unbelief and belief? How can virgin and motherhood coincide? Thinking back one more, once more to rest on the flight into Egypt. How can they coincide? Um, these paradoxical between states or crunch points are also include moments of conversion and not least the event of death. Caravaggio understands death as a type of brink on the two sides of which a living quality and a dead quality are distributed, which are separated by it, the death brink, but also connected by it. Thus he makes the moment of death visible, for example, in the shattered symmetry of a face. But there are other, more complex cases. I'm thinking of one of Caravaggio's last paintings, the grazing of Lazarus, the painting in Syracuse, uh, in Sicily, which was made as an altar painting for a uh, uh, fraternity in Syracuse. Uh, Lazarus is neither living nor dead, famous interpretation of analysis of this painting, of course, again, by Louis Marat, you know it very well. Lazarus is neither living nor dead, or he is both at once. For he is in the process of crossing the axis of death. Since he is crossing it for the second time, the moment does not proceed from living to dead, but rather from dead to living. But what's important is the in-betweenness. We see Lazarus half raised in a situation between horizontal and vertical. Unlike the skull on a, under his head, he is no longer lying on the ground or in the ground. Unlike Christ on the other side, he is not yet standing. His head lies dead on the neck. His right hand is raised vitally. Lazarus' face and the face of his sister bent over, bent over him relate to each other like positive and negative. Of course, it's really it's really positive and, neg uh, and negative form. It's not only the turning operation, it's also positive and negative form because of, uh, the light is coming from this direction. So here, here what, is, what is in shadow here is in the light here. Uh, um, very moving motive, this motive of love. Um, but what is interesting about this, once again, is not the opposition as such, but rather that which lies between the two faces, seen on the level of content, as the X or inhalation of life, formerly a rotation of 180 degrees, which produces a double face. Of course, the motive is a long story, you know it, but here it's articulated in a very um, precise fashion. If we now take into view the pictorial field as a whole, it becomes clear that the duplicitous figure of Lazarus relates not only to the opposition of horizontal and vertical, but simultaneously to that of left and right, whereby the left side radiates light and life, while the right side reaches toward the grave and decay. But this axis, too, is internally divided or dichotomous. It cannot be determined whether this is a gesture of receiving <laughs> or warding off, whether the open palm absorbs the light, like a light-sensitive surface, like our screen, or whether it merely reflects, uh, like it, if it absorbs it, or whether it merely, merely reflects it. So this is, there is also some kind of, of course, duplicitous nature of this gesture, which is so much related to the central axis of this painting, how it actually relates to, uh, and also what it relates to. There's the relation to Christ, in the sh his, whose head is in the shadow, but to light, and it's warding off, but it's also receiving. Uh, um, can it thus be said that Caravaggio's painting stands under the sign of two? Are his paintings figures of two? What is the figure of two? I show you the figure of two. This is the figure of two. Giordano Bruno, uh, 
Where is it? In one of his. It's in the. It's in the. It's in the. It's in the. Uh, it's in the book on the. Uh, on all the figures of the different different numbers. Forgot the, uh, uh, forgot the name. A beautiful uh, book of Giordano Bruno's. This is the figure of two. Many of them proved to be. Of course, I also wanted to take this in because you see. Uh, we come a little bit back to Leonardo da Vinci because the, the two rings, they're actually uh, braided, the two rings. It's a figure of two. Uh, many of them proved to be latent diptychs. Sorry, it won't, I won't go on too long uh, um, now. Many of them are latent diptychs, and there's no doubt about the two wings of a diptych. It's two. But the word diptych contains ptichs. Diptych contains ptichs, the Greek words for fold, chasm, and hinge, ptix. A very suitable word for this, ptix. And this is how it stands with the thing itself. The diptych only becomes a diptych through the hinge that simultaneously connects the two wings and keeps them apart, so that they hold together but also remain mobile with respect to each other and can be folded. Inasmuch as the hinge belongs neither to the one wing nor to the other, it is a third entity. But it is naturally not a third wing, just as the fold is not a part of the fabric it lies in, and the cut is not a part of the thing that it passes through, and death cannot be located either on the side of the living or the dead. Caravaggio's painting thus perhaps only seems to rhyme with two. It is more correct to say that it stands under the sign of betweenness, the double or duplicitous symmetries. It is awkward to speak this way since even the word between contains a form of two. Tween, there is the two again in the word. Maybe two strands have to be separated. There is duality and there is duplicity. Duplicity, however, engenders pairs, engenders pairs, or is nestled in the between space of pairs, duplicity, not duality. While duality belongs in the realm of numbers, duplicity is uncountable. It implies an uncountable third entity that keeps two things from happening. It keeps one from remaining by itself and it keeps two from being clearly differentiated or really apart. Caravaggio's paintings are therefore not figures of two. At most, they are figures of that which, like Goethe's Ginkgo leaf, is both one and doubled. Fühlst du nicht an meinen Liedern, dass ich eins und doppelt bin? Doesn't, don't you feel by, by my songs that I'm one and two at the same time? This, this is from this, this East-Western Divan of Goethe, which was actually co-authored by Marianne from Willemer. Uh, but are these pictures figures at all, or do they contain figures? For this question, too, I only know a double or duplicitous answer. Yes, they are figures in that something becomes visible in them. No, they are not figures if you take figure to mean an articulated and closed form, like in geometry. The unique power of Caravaggio's paintings, in my mind, does not lie in articulated figures, but rather in that which, in that which articulates or disarticulates them. In a way, I'm only repeating Louis Marin's uh, insights here. It lies in moments of articulating and disarticulation, moments of separating and connection, and the connection of separating and connection. His paintings are not figures, because like the bodies that they put on view, they have no head or closure. They are open, unsealed, and bring into view in a curious way that the act of sealing or representing cannot seal or represent itself. We have had this image of Tethys last time with the body of okay, the act of sealing. She's sealing the body of her son, but, but she cannot seal it completely because they are where she where the action of, of, uh, of, of sealing has, gets its hold of this body, there is the little hole, or like in Leonardo's uh, circle, it doesn't close. This may be one reason why Marin was able to arrive at the idea that it, in this painting the act of representation is inscribed in each represented thing and constantly unsettles it. 
Caravaggio or the Achilles heel of representation. But let's not uh, get ahead of ourselves. Let's remain with the painting of duplicity. Some new kind of formalism would be needed in order to be able to describe these things more faithfully. For example, Amor, victorious, who has not yet toppled over but continues to mock our inertness or stupidity. Did we overlook the work of this articulation? Caravaggio destroys the body as a figure. He deforms it, sometimes forcibly. Instead of a body with a crowning head, he prefers to show the opposite, a body that grows from its right leg as from a stalk. This stalk extends into the torso. The left leg and right arm can be seen as branchings. As if the point were to parody the principle of unity, not by turning it on its head, but rather by settling it down, setting it down on one of its legs, which, becomes, which then becomes a head leg. A head leg, double thing. No, the thing is, uh, he is destroying the unity up there, bending the head to the side. But there is some unity here. The whole body is growing out of this leg. This is the parody <laughs> of what the head normally is in relation to the body. So it turns it, turns it around in a kind of mock way. Uh, uh, and this is also part of this work of disarticulating, so something a body doesn't close in to become really a figure. The left leg and right arm can be seen as branchings, as we've seen, and blah, blah, blah. Sometimes it can also be observed um, how Caravaggio pairs different bodies in such a way that it becomes questionable to which body the limbs or organs belong. Very important motive in him. So there's also these motives where you can't, uh, 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 where you can't tell self-touching and touching of the other from apart. Touching, it becomes difficult to, 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 to uh, differentiate between these two things. Sorry for my uh, kind of bad reading. Um, the bodies doubled in themselves then become interwoven. Here I'm thinking above all, so maybe, maybe here we come back to this motif of braiding and interweaving we've had in Leonardo. Sometimes it can be observed how blah blah in such a way it becomes um, it becomes questionable to which body the limbs belong. The bodies double in themselves, they become interwoven. Here I'm thinking above all, though it, again it's not the only example of the first discarded version of the altar painting for the Contarelli uh, chapel, for the altar painting and later in Berlin and then unfortunately destroyed in the Second World War. Uh, the wings if it is not in Russia somewhere. Uh, uh, the wings of the angel uh, the book on St. Matthew's knee, the folding chair on which, he, on which he sits on, the two-fold structures of the two bodies, such an interweaving of things that are at once one and doubled can almost make you dizzy. It's a fantastic painting. Uh, the paired limbs, a uh, radical painting. I mean, the, the painting which is now in the Contarelli Chapel, the altar painting is also a great painting, but this is clearly, <laughs> clearly uh, uh, much more audacious uh, uh, painting. Uh, the paired limbs of the human body are thrown into a jumble, not so extremely as to undermine the principle of pairing, but rather so as to make the possibility of other pairings become visible. One notices the cross rhyme of the legs. On the far left, a bent leg. If we add the leg of the chair, it's two legs. Then a uh, apparently straight leg. Then again, a bent one. And finally, a straight one. So bent straight, bent straight. The figure of this rhyme, if it is one, is played out cleverly against the formal unity of the bodies, since that which rhymes belong to different bodies. The two straight legs, the two bent legs, there's an are related to each other but belong to different bodies. It's similar with the arms. The right arm of the saint 
saint communicates more strongly with the right arm of the angel than with his own left arm, which is cut by a shadow and which itself more readily forms a pair with the angel's left arm. So of course, there's the strong connection between these two arms and it's very difficult to see the other arm of the saint. Also there's this cut, so it's separate, but this can be seen together with this arm. So we've got also the, the wrong arms brought uh, together in this kind of interweaving of, of bodies. It's similar with blah, blah. Uh, Self-touch and touching the other become indistinguishable in the center of this painting. What remains is the idea of a folding body that constantly disarticulates and rearticulates. Again, inspiration, which is what is this painting about, inspiration is not visualized as a divine breath or some light, but rather, of course, this plays also a role, but rather as the interweaving of self and other. Instead of giving a figure of inspiration, the painter interprets it, inspiration, as the defiguration and refiguration of interweaving bodies. To my mind, this is, this is, this is a very strong kind of um, showing what inspiration might be. Of course, these remain very crude suggestions. We are only starting to see, maybe one should start to write about Caravaggio. Uh, Caravaggio's art has been thoroughly sealed. I don't say by whom or what, but it is not a closed book. Rather, through and through, it is a latent diptych or crossing of diptychs. It is a painting of pairs of pages, wings, arms and legs, and above all, it is a painting of that which is operant at the joints and axes of these realities, in separating and connecting them simultaneously. But real paradoxes cannot be asserted or spelled out without being simultaneously negated. They cannot be forced into resolution, cannot be brought to a head without having their heads taken off. <coughs> Thus the truth of the paradoxical remains unresolved. But this doesn't have to be disturbing. Not everything that has hands and feet has to be closed off by a head. Thank you. Thank you.